Islam is a collection of teachings and practices that were common in Arabia during the time of Muhammad. There were several tribes of Jews preaching monotheism in Arabia. These Jews had the Torah along with tons of other stories that were recorded in the Talmud and other sources. Many of the stories in these additional sources were based on biblical characters, but they were fictitious. Stories about Abraham being delivered from a fire, or a bird teaching Cain to bury his brother, or Solomon talking to animals. Muhammad heard the stories, and now they're in the Quran. There were also a variety of tales about Jesus and Mary that certain heretical Christian groups believed. Stories about Jesus speaking at birth, Jesus giving life to clay birds, Mary giving birth under a palm tree, and so on. No historian on the planet believes that these stories are authentic, but they were popular in Arabia during the 7th century. Muhammad heard them, and now they're in the Quran. In Surah 18, Allah tells us that Dhul Karnain, the Arabic name for Alexander the Great, traveled so far west, he found the place where the sun sets. This was a popular story during Muhammad's lifetime. Muhammad heard it, now it's in the Quran. The Quran even claims that Alexander the Great was a devout Muslim, when we know historically that he was a complete pagan. During Muhammad's time, the Sabians, who are mentioned several times in the Quran, recited a creed, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. Muhammad heard this creed and simply added the words, and Muhammad is his messenger. The Sabians also prayed at all five of the times Muslims pray during their prescribed daily prayers. Some of the Persians believed that after death, a paradise of sensual delights awaited them, complete with huris, the perpetual virgins Muslims believe they'll be awarded in paradise. It seems that Muhammad simply took a bunch of the beliefs and practices that were popular in 7th century Arabia, gave them an Islamic twist, and incorporated them into his new religion. The pagans, by the way, thought this was hilarious. They regularly made fun of Muhammad for believing everything he heard, so they called him the Ear. Let's read a passage from Ibn Asak about Muhammad and one of his critics, a man named Nabtal. I have heard that it was of him that the apostle said, Whoever wants to see Satan, let him take a look at Nabtal bin al-Harith. He was a sturdy black man with long flowing hair, inflamed eyes, and dark ruddy cheeks. He used to come and talk to the apostle and listen to him, and then carry what he had said to the hypocrites. It was he who said, Muhammad is all ears. If anyone tells him anything, he believes it. God sent down concerning him, in Surah 9, verse 61 of the Quran, And of them are those who annoy the prophet, and say, He is all ears. Say, Good ears for you. He believes in God, and trusts the believers, and is a mercy for those of you who believe. And those who annoy the apostle of God, for them is a painful punishment. So the pagans could tell that Muhammad was simply adopting stories and practices for Islamic purposes. Not surprisingly, the Hajj, the annual pilgrimage to Mecca, is saturated in paganism and idolatry. During the Hajj, Muslims walk circles around the Kaaba, the cubicle shrine that they pray to. They kiss the black stone. They run back and forth between the hills of Safa and Marwa, and so on. Where did they get these practices? Before Muhammad conquered Mecca, the Kaaba was a center of pagan worship in Arabia. The Kaaba was surrounded by 360 pagan idols. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2478, narrated Abdullah bin Masud. The Prophet entered Mecca, and at that time there were 360 idols around the Kaaba. He started stabbing the idols with a stick he had in his hand and reciting, and say, truth, i.e. Islamic monotheism, or this Quran, or jihad against polytheists, has come, and batal, falsehood, i.e. Satan or polytheism, has vanished. This is when Muhammad took control of the Kaaba. But why would he want to take control of a pagan temple and make it the center of Islamic worship? Let's back up a bit. When Muhammad and his followers were in Mecca years earlier, they prayed facing Jerusalem. The pagans prayed facing the Kaaba. Muslims prayed facing Jerusalem like the Jews. You could line up the Kaaba and Jerusalem if you wanted so that you were facing both. But the Qibla, the direction of prayer, was Jerusalem. When Muhammad was in Mecca, he really thought that the Jews were going to accept him as a prophet. The Muslim community eventually moved to Medina, and the Jews could tell immediately that Muhammad was a false prophet because they knew the Torah, and Muhammad only knew some stories that he had heard. He was all ears, remember. But Muhammad couldn't even get those stories right, so the Jews rejected him. 
And Allah said to Muhammad in Surah 2, verse 144 of the Quran, Now shall we turn thee to a Qibla that shall please thee. Turn then thy face in the direction of the sacred mosque. So Allah's goal in telling Muslims to face the Kaaba was to please Muhammad. It's amazing how much of Islam is dedicated to pleasing the man who was receiving the revelations. Why would facing the Kaaba please Muhammad? Two reasons. One, he was sending the Jews a message. This is what you get for rejecting me. Two, Muhammad had grown up among pagans who prayed facing the Kaaba and all its idols. So praying to the Kaaba was normal for them. It felt right. But how could Muhammad justify praying towards a pagan shrine? Well, just a few verses earlier, in Surah 2, verse 127, Allah declared that the Kaaba was built by Abraham and Ishmael. Now that's interesting. If it was built by Abraham and Ishmael, why did Muslims spend more than a decade praying towards Jerusalem? Why does it seem like Muhammad is inventing this as he goes along? One of life's great mysteries. But what evidence do we have that the Kaaba was built by Abraham and Ishmael? Absolutely none, apart from the fact that Muhammad said it. That's good enough for Muslims, but it shouldn't be, because Muhammad had absolutely no clue what he was talking about, and I can prove it. Sahih al-Bukhari, 3366. Narrated Abu Dar, I said, O Allah's Messenger, which mosque was first built on the surface of the earth? He said, Al-Masjid al-Haram, at Mecca. I said, which was built next? He replied, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa at Jerusalem. I said, what was the period of construction between the two? He said, 40 years. According to Muhammad, there was a 40 year gap between the construction of the Kaaba and the temple in Jerusalem. Why is this important? Well, we know when the Jerusalem temple was built. Solomon built it in the 10th century BC. That's more than a thousand years after Abraham. If Abraham built the Kaaba, he built it more than a thousand years before Solomon built the Jerusalem temple. But Muhammad said that they were built 40 years apart. So we need to ask our Muslim friends, where did Abraham and Ishmael get their time machine? Because if they didn't have a time machine, Muhammad was wrong, and we can't trust what he says about the construction of the Kaaba. And without Muhammad making up stories about Abraham and Ishmael and the Kaaba, the only evidence we have tells us that Muslims are bowing down to a pagan temple and taking a pilgrimage to a pagan temple and walking circles around a pagan temple. By the way, why do Muslims walk circles around the Kaaba? The pagans walked circles around the Kaaba too. Why did they do that? The Muslim scholar and Quran translator Yusuf Ali in his commentary on the Quran has an appendix on ancient forms of pagan worship. He writes, It will be noticed that the sun and the moon and the five planets got identified each with a living deity, god or goddess, with characteristic qualities of its own. The ancients knew about the stars and constellations, but they also knew about seven heavenly objects that seemed to have their own motions. The Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They didn't have telescopes yet, so they didn't know about the other planets. According to the pagans, each of these seven heavenly objects was orbiting the Earth, and each was associated with a particular pagan deity. Why did the pagans of Mecca circle the Kaaba seven times? to honor and worship the seven planetary deities that they believed were circling the earth. This is as pagan as you can possibly get, and now this thoroughly pagan practice is one of the five pillars of Islam. But let me guess, if it looks like paganism and walks like paganism and talks like paganism, it must be pure monotheism in disguise, right? When they visit the Kaaba, Muslims do their best to kiss the black stone. That's funny, the pagans of Arabia used to worship stones too. Sahih al-Bukhari, 4376, narrated Abu Raja al-Uttaridi, We used to worship stones, and when we found a better stone than the first one, we would throw the first stone and take the latter. But if we could not get a stone, then we would collect some earth, i.e. soil, and then bring a sheep, and milk that sheep over it, and perform the tawaf around it. When the month of Rajab came, we used to stop the military actions, calling this month the Iron Remover, because we used to remove and throw away the iron parts of every spear and arrow in the month of Rajab. What did the pagans worship? A stone. 
and they would trade that stone for a better stone to worship. When does that process stop? When you get to the best stone, the black stone at the Kaaba. That's what the pagans did. What do Muslims do when they get to the Kaaba? They kiss the black stone. It's as if Muslims are saying, we want to be as idolatrous as possible, but we're still not idolaters. Interestingly, even Muhammad's companions understood that kissing the black stone was idolatry, but they kept doing it anyway because Muhammad had done it. In Sahih al-Bukhari, 1597, we read, Narrated Abbas bin Rabia, Umar came near the black stone and kissed it and said, No doubt I know that you are a stone and can neither harm anyone nor benefit anyone. Had I not seen Allah's messenger kissing you, I would not have kissed you. This is Umar, the second rightly guided caliph, saying that he knows he shouldn't be kissing a pagan idol like the black stone, but he does it anyway because Muhammad did it. But there's more idolatry during the Hajj. When the pagans took the pilgrimage to Mecca, they would run back and forth between the hills of Safa and Marwa. They ran back and forth between them to honor the pagan idols. Yusuf Ali comments on Surah 2, verse 158 of the Quran, the virtue of patient perseverance and faith leads to the mention of two symbolic monuments of that virtue. These are the two little hills of Safa and Marwa, now absorbed in the city of Mecca, and close to the well of Zamzam. Here, according to tradition, the Lady Hagar, mother of the infant Ismail, prayed for water in the parched desert, and in her eager quest round these hills, she found her prayer answered and saw the Zamzam spring. Unfortunately, the pagan Arabs had placed a male and a female idol here, and their gross and superstitious rites caused offense to the early Muslims. Now, how do we know that Hagar and Ishmael were ever at these hills? Because Muhammad said it, right? And Muhammad's the guy who thought that Abraham and Solomon lived 40 years apart and that Alexander the Great was a Muslim? Least reliable source of historical information ever. But what do we actually know here? We know that pagans used to run back and forth as part of their idol worship. And the early Muslims knew this as well. Sahih al-Bukhari, 3847. Narrated Ibn Abbas, to run along the valley between the two green pillars of Asafa and Al-Marwa mountains was not Sunnah. But the people in the pre-Islamic period of ignorance used to run along it and used to say, we do not cross this rain stream except running in great haste. Now, this is devastating to Islam because Ibn Abbas says that this practice was just a pagan practice. It wasn't part of the Sunnah of Muhammad. Notice the commentary at the bottom. This statement of Ibn Abbas is wrong as most of the religious scholars consider it a Sunnah of the Prophet. Most of the religious scholars, in order to rescue Islam, have to throw Ibn Abbas under the bus. This is getting ridiculous. Sahih al-Bukhari, 4496. Narrated Asim bin Suleiman, I asked Anas bin Malik about Asafa and Al Marwa. Anas replied, We used to consider going around them a custom of the pre Islamic period of ignorance. So when Islam came, we gave up going around them. Then Allah revealed, Verily, Asafa and Al Marwa, two mountains at Mecca, are of the symbols of Allah. So it is not a sin on him who performs Hajj or Umrah pilgrimage of the house, the Kaaba at Mecca. Here again, the early Muslims understood that this was a pagan practice. They said that they stopped doing it when they became Muslims. But Muhammad liked it, so it ended up in the Quran. How much paganism can you fit into one religion? Quite a bit, it seems. And two things are amazing here. First, it's amazing that Muslims who are swimming in a sea of pagan practices are deluded enough to think that they're the true champions of monotheism. They're doing everything the pagans did. They just rename it monotheism. Second, the pagans of Arabia were local groups. They weren't going to spread their pagan practices around the world. But Islam has taken the same idolatrous pagan nonsense practiced by the Meccans and spread it around the world. This means that Islam is the greatest source of idolatry and paganism in history. Now, to you Muslims who insist on taking the pilgrimage to Mecca in spite of its pagan roots, I make a simple request. Watch this video, where I talk about the Kaaba and how you can convert your false pagan worship into something that actually involves God. I'm not sure you'll like it, 
but it will definitely be an improvement over spending your lives kissing a pagan rock and running around a pagan cube and celebrating the seven false planetary deities and having no idea that you've been duped. The chief export of Saudi Arabia is not oil. It's paganism and terrorism. Off topic, but I couldn't resist.